So in, in the same year, I think that was 57, Billy Wilder's witness for the prosecution released in which you kind of play a much more serious role than we might say for Seven Brides or Funny Face. Oh, um, yes. How, how did that casting come about for you? And what do you think Billy and the casting director saw in you that helped land that gig? I've got to tell you, this is a press agent's dream story. I had been invited by a friend who was uh, wealthy and, and, a, and a great host uh, to go to the opening of Frank Sinatra at the Mocambo, which was then one of the hot night spots in Southern California. And I had never seen Frank Sinatra live when he was having girls faint in the aisles at the Paramount in New York, et cetera. I was too young, but I certainly had all of his recordings of the unrequited love songs and he just made my heart go pitter patter. So I went to see him and our table was directly under Frank's little dais that he was standing on because the orchestra filled the entire stage. Nightclub stages are not huge mm -hmm. and filled the entire stage. And he was on this tiny podium and I was looking up at him the whole time, obviously with my mouth hanging open. And a note came to our host and said, would he bring Miss Lee around to meet him because he was almost behind Frank Sinatra. We were so filled that his podium had him out a little bit and he was a little further back. And I went back with my host and he said, hello, my name is Arthur Hornblow Jr. This is my wife. And I am producing a picture called Witness for the Prosecution. And I have just given you young lady a very unique screen test. I watched you watch Frank Sinatra, and I think that you would be a very good love interest for Tyrone Power in my movie. Would you come in tomorrow and meet with Billy Wilder? And I thought, my God, would today be too soon? I, this was just too amazing. And so I went in, they put me on film, and took a few pictures and had me say, hello, how are you? And that's it. And that night they looked at the rushes and I got the job, except I also became a brunette because Marlena Dietrich said, Nick Nine, forget it. She is blonde like me. And I became a brunette overnight and fade out, fade in. I came into to the movie. I had the best time of my life, and I became very best friends with Charles Lawton and his wonderful wife, Elsa Lanchester, and it was a fabulous experience for me. Now, a year or two later, as you all probably know, Frank Sinatra loved nothing more than having dinner at his home, a big Italian dinner, and to screen a new movie. And what's the movie they're screening that night at his home? But Witness for the Prosecution. And he happens to have as a guest Howard Koch, whom I'd worked for many times at Warner Brothers. He said, Howie, you know, I've been watching this Ruta Lee chick on, on television a lot. Uh, what do you say we put her in one of our upcoming films? And that's how I got to be the leading lady to Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, Peter Lawford, the Crosby Boys, everybody it seemed like in the world, and became one of the Rat Pack in Sergeant's Three. Is that a story or a story? And he never knew that I got the job in witness for the prosecution because of my love for him. I mean, it's just I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to get to get the call for a film like Sergeant's Three with the entire Rat Pack in it. I mean, that's just such a cool story. And and what an amazing experience. We were on location in Kanab, Utah, and Frank, being Frank, uh, did everything with airplanes. He had a fleet of planes available. And I mean, Kanab is the most beautiful state physically because of all of the canyons and the mountains. And I went to work every day in a helicopter. When one minute I'd be chasing jackrabbits across an open field and then up into an eagle's area 
uh, and, and down into a canyon. And oh my God, what an experience it was. And, and just knowing Frank Sinatra and having him as a friend was a beautiful experience. He was probably one of the most loving, generous men I've ever known. And it breaks my heart that the press always picked up on the, the tough side of him, on the, the, the side that was in fights all the time or arguments or, or hating the press and, and you know making snide remarks. But because he was truly the most generous person I've ever known. And and the Rat Pack, though, I mean, they were kind of notoriously kind of a rowdy body bunch when they got together. So I can only imagine what it would have been like on set with the crew of them being together every day. I mean, because they they would cut up so much and they were just they they were just so tight and could play off each other so well. Is there a crazy story from from either on or off the sets of Sergeants 3 that you've never forgotten? That would be one of those cool things to share. Well, I, I one time thought, I mean, they were playing pranks with each other all the time. So I sort of had to get into that and play a prank too. So when Frank went out for lunch, all the guys went off to have lunch somewhere. We were on the set back at Goldwyn shooting interiors. Uh, I had somebody come, my family, my mother came, my father came, and I had a blow up machine and we blew up probably 150 balloons. And uh, I stuffed them all into Frank's dressing room so that he couldn't get in to his dressing room. It would be a surprise, which was a great laugh and great fun until the balloons started popping in the middle of takes. Now there are 150 balloons piled in there. Somebody had to go in and, and pop, pop them everyone. all. And I thought, oh geez, I have just cost the studio, I don't know how many thousands of dollars to have to cut tape and, or cut film. And yeah. Frank, of course, would do one take, two, that was it. He would rehearse and say to the crew, I don't care if it takes you three days to set up the shot. Don't tell me when I come into the shot that the floor creaked or a light fell or whatever, you know. Yeah, I'm doing it once, twice. It's and a look what I cost. Oh, boy. That was something that I was never sure that anybody was going to forgive me for. But it was a great laugh when he opened the door. <laughs> is is it true, uh, Frank and and the boys kind of treated you like a sister, and that they'd kind of shuttle you out of things if things? Unfortunately, were getting a too crazy? yes. <laughs> so, so you missed the you missed just the craziest think, parts of the party. If I had had an affair with one or all of those guys, just think of the books I could have written instead of the one that I have, <laughs> but, so, or along with the ones that I have. Speaking of book, I, I think this is kind of fun because Frank would have loved the title, which is consider your ass, ass kissed. kissed. And it happens to be an expression that I have used forever in the way of thanking anybody that has given me money for my charity, the Thalians, which Debbie Reynolds and I were the head mamas of. And whenever someone gave me $50 or $500 or $500,000, I would say, consider your ass kissed. And I meant it from the bottom of my heart. And my dear friend, uh, uh, who is George Pinocchio, who is the red carpet man for ABC television, uh, said, you know, if you ever get this book written, Ruta, that you've been writing now for five years, uh, you have to use that as a title. So I took his advice and said, that's it. And, and you know, Dave, there are some people, especially down south, and you cover a lot of that territory, who kind of go, oh, that's that's such a rude word. And I thought, you know, hold on a second. In the Bible, it says that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on his ass. Well, if he could do that, I can kiss an ass. And therefore, there we are. And that's the title of my book. Well, and I think it, you, you, when you come from a certain, you know, age of Hollywood and you're and and with all the luminaries you've worked with, I think you've earned the right to say pretty much whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean it with love and appreciation.